This guy goes back in time to high school to right his wrongs. Boy, I wish I could do that. So we're first given a little tour of Hayden High School. Then we see a young boy hooping. He's just making back-to-back -back baskets. Not one brick, not one air ball. What a guy. His name is Mike O'Donnell. The year is 1989. Mike's coach, Coach Murphy, comes in and tells him that he just spoke with the scout, who's ready to give him a full scholarship to college if he pays only half of what he's capable of tonight. Oh, you know this isn't going to end well. The rest of the team now come around to pose for a photo. Mike says they can't take the photo without his best friend, Ned. And one of the guys says, who cares? He's the water boy. But Mike says, it doesn't matter. He's a part of the team. As he says that, Ned comes in. And I have to say his parents named him just right because he is a nerd. Anyway, Ned joins and they take the photo. After that, it's game time. The cheerleaders are doing their thing while Ned and Mike are having a conversation. Mike joins the girls to dance and he's really killing it. He seems like he can do it all. Once he's done dancing, his girlfriend, Scarlett, comes to see him. She says everything is fine, but her face tells a completely different story. She doesn't want to tell him, but Mike insists. So she tells him, she's pregnant, and it totally ruins his mood. Relatable. He goes to play and he's having the worst game of his life. All his teammates are yelling at him. His coach is yelling at him. The scout is giving him weird looks. And what does Mike do? He drops the ball and runs after his girlfriend. Um, sir, what are you doing? This game is your future. And that's exactly what his girlfriend tells him, but he says no. The baby is his future. And he's not talking about hit rapper The Baby. Anyway, they can both be your future at the same time. It's not like Scarlett is in labor right now. Now. He's out there lifting his girlfriend and twirling her around while the game is going on. Well, I guess we're all stupid in high school, even the star ballers. That stupidity lands Mike where he is now, squatting with Ned and having to listen to him chew so loudly after Scarly kicked him out of the house. Plus, she's filing for divorce. By the way, what are those ears on Ned? Anyway, it appears that Mike is supposed to get a big promotion at work today. He goes into the office and his boss is making a presentation saying, maybe in certain situations, being bricked up for four hours isn't such a terrible thing. There's actually no situation in this universe or outside it where that isn't a terrible thing, and there's no way corporate can spin that. Well, after the presentation, he says he'll be naming the new regional sales manager. Mike thinks it's him. He's smiling and winking, but of course it's not him. It's Wendy who's sitting right beside him. In fact, he asked Mike to move so he can congratulate Wendy. Double jeopardy, bro. The ladies are happy for Wendy. I say ladies because Mike and the four-hour guy are the only two guys at the meeting. The ladies leave and Mike goes to confront the boss. Wendy has been at the company just two months, while Mike has been there for 16 years. How come she was the one who got the promotion? Sex is a moment. The guy's giving some BS explanation, and Mike has had it up to here. He takes the boss's earpiece, smashes it on the wall, and quits. To add insult to injury, while Mike is in the elevator, the girls come in and are chanting, Wendy, Wendy. Isn't that too many people for one elevator, by the way? Anyway, Mike drives straight to his high school and walks into the basketball court. Of course, he regrets his decision to that day. How couldn't he? He's walking around the school and thinking back to how things were for him back then. While he's looking at the picture they took back then, this Santa Claus-looking janitor walks up to him and calls out his name. Mike doesn't know him, but obviously, Obviously, he knows Mike. He's now saying that high school stars like Mike, who failed to live up to their potential, always return to the school to picture the glory days and wonder what might have been. I too peaked in high school. He says they're always living in the past, and Mike says, of course. He does want to live in the past. Then Santa Claus says, I'll bet you wish you could do it all over again. Mike says, you got that right. Santa Claus says, are you sure about that? And Mike says, oh yeah. Just then, the bell goes, and his daughter comes out with three of her friends. She asks what he's doing there, and he wanted to say he was just talking to the janitor, but he finds out that the janitor was nowhere to be found. He had disappeared. He tells his daughter to go get her brother so they can go for some ice cream. Meanwhile, her friends are fawning over him. Mike, his daughter Maggie, and his son Alex are now at this ice cream place. And why are there so many kids? He's trying to get some conversations going with his kids, but it's not really working. His son is also a basketball player, and Mike is trying to make sure he's on track to get a scholarship. He drops the kids home, and he sees his wife destroying the yard. He confronts her, and she tells him it's not their yard. It's her yard. And from this conversation, we find out that Mike has spent the last 18 years whining to Scarlett about what he could have done without her. Oh, I see why she wants a divorce. As they're still at the yard, Naomi, Scarlett's best friend, shows up. And what should she say? That they have to put Scarlett back on the market. She even told her she's caked up. Anyway, the ladies go into the house just as the weather changes. A dramatic drop of rain falls on Mike when he goes in his car. And as he's driving home, strange things start happening. The radio is changing by itself. And then he sees a man standing on the railing of the bridge ready to jump down. Being a good man, Mike gets down from his car to try and get the man to come down. And then he finds out that it's Santa Claus janitor. He turns back, smiles at Mike, and then after a truck passes, we don't see him again. Mike hurries to look down the bridge and he sees something that looks like a hole. In that hole, he can see his younger self waving at him. Then before we know it, he's pulled into the hole. Next thing we see is a really muddy 17-year-old Mike stepping out of his car.
Picard into his house to take a shower. He sees himself in the mirror and screams. Ned hears that and puts on his best gladiator look to go after the intruder. Mike is trying to explain that it's him, but Ned just keeps swinging his axe at him. Mike takes his shield from the wall to defend himself and eventually throws Ned downstairs. He jumps down athletically and says, oh wow, I feel great. But Ned is not yet convinced. He keeps attacking Mike with a sword. Why does this guy have so many gladiator weapons? But this is not even a joke. He nearly stabs Mike in the chest, but Mike manages to turn to the last second, so Ned only gets the chair. That doesn't stop him. He's still swinging at Mike, not listening to his friend, who has been saying, it's me, Mike. It's a me, Mike. <laughs> the fight soon switches from using gladiator weapons to using lightsabers, and now Mike is trying to tell Ned things about him that only his best friend would know, including the fact that one of his balls hasn't dropped yet. Okay, I surely did not need to know that. But hey, that still doesn't convince him. He puts Mike on the ground and goes to grab something to smash his head in. That thing happens to be a picture of him with Mike back in high school. That was what finally convinced him, but he still dropped the picture on Mike's head and he blacked out. After some time, Mike wakes up and Ned won't stop staring at him while he's icing his head. He's freaked out. I mean, who won't be? He's trying to figure out how this transformation happened though. His theory has something to do with gamma rays. That's why all these books are littered on his table, but the most likely explanation is spirit guide transformation magic. Basically, Mike has been transformed by a spirit guide to set him on a new path, his spirit guide being the janitor. So he rushes to the school and is asking for the janitor, but nobody at school knows him or has ever seen him. In fact, he looks like a madman asking for the janitor. Then the lights flicker. He sees water on the floor and traces it down to the basketball court. That's enough for him. He rushes back to Ned and tells him he has it all figured out. He's going back to high school. They get in an argument over that, but Mike insists. Ned then reluctantly agrees, but tells Mike not to suck him into any of this, as high school was the lowest point of his life. But what do you think happens? Of course, he was sucked in. What are best friends for? They're now at the principal's office, and Ned is acting as Mike's dad, and they're trying to get Mike enrolled. Ned sees the principal, Jane Masterson, and completely falls in love with her at first sight. He tries to shoot his shot by calling Mike, who's now going by Mark, by the way. A bastard. He tells Jane he's single and rich cannot relate. Except for the single part. But let's take a minute and look at what Mike is wearing. What the hell is all this? Anyway, Mike hands his forged transcripts, thanks to Ned, to the principal, and it works. She says she thinks Hayden would be lucky to have him, and she admits him. Instead of Ned saying his goodbyes, he decides to continue shooting his shot. At this point, Jane just straight up tells him she doesn't date students' parents, and he basically infers, but I think that wouldn't faze him. They go to school and Mike tries to hit on Maggie's friends. Kind of sus. Remember they were fawning over him the other time? But they just blow him off now. And not in the fun way. Then Ned says, well, Welcome to the bottom of the food chain. Of course, he understands what it feels like to be there. We all do, don't we? He now tells Mike they're going shopping, so at least he doesn't look like a douche. Next day, Mike, or should we say Mark, pulls up at school in a really sweet car looking like a really cool kid. And now, all eyes are on him. But he gets to the hallway, the bell goes, and he seems lost as students pour in from all sides. He's literally just being pushed from all sides. He finally gets into class and still looks lost when his wife calls. He's supposed to be at the divorce thing, but he forgot. He's now making up excuses when a girl in class asks Mike if he would consider dating a 10th grader. Of course, you know how that would sound to Scarlett, so her lawyer immediately says they can go for full custody. Mike says she can't take his kids away from him, and she asks, since when do you care? Just as Maggie was walking into the class. So Mike says, I'm a lot closer to them than you think. And of course, he was talking literally. It's pretty creepy though. He waves to Maggie and she's not really feeling her younger dad, but her friend is. Uh, I, don't, I don't know about this movie. Now he's on the basketball court and he's really having the time of his life. The coach walks in and guess who the coach is? Yes, Coach Murphy. Mike sees him and says, you're still here? And coach is confused. Why are you confused though? You want to tell me you don't remember this face? He was literally your star player. Come on. Anyway, Coach Murphy says it's his last year's coach and he invites Mike for tryouts. Now Mike is in the bathroom giving Ned updates over the phone and Ned says he needs him to get in trouble so the principal can ask to meet with his father. Ned may not be going back to the basketball court, but he's really trying to score. I respect that. While Mike is trying to take a leak, he hears someone call out for help. He looks and it's his son, Alex, taped to a toilet. He says the basketball team did this to him and Mike is confused because he thought Alex was popular. He introduces himself to Alex as his uncle Ned's son and rips off the tape. Now they're in the cafeteria together and Mike notices his son looking at a girl, Nicole. He obviously likes her but he says she's the head cheerleader and she'll never date him. Just walk up to her and say hi and remember to just be yourself. Anyway, Mike tries to encourage his son and in doing so forgets the plot of the movie and starts talking to him like he's his dad, saying, when I first met your mother, and all that stuff. Alex is like, huh? But Mike manages to cover up and says he was only joking. While they're still eating, the chief bully of the school, Stan, walks in with his boys, and Alex says he hates him. He's the one who taped him to the toilet, and he even shoved him in a washing machine in his own house yesterday. Step bros do the darndest things. How did the school bully get into his house, right? Apparently, Stan is Maggie's boyfriend. Uh-oh. He even goes over and kisses Maggie right there, and you can see the disappointment of a father in Mike's eyes. 
Well, that's what you get for going to school with your kids. He keeps making eye contact with Stan and he comes to the table where Mike and Alex are seated. He bounces a ball off Alex's head, but his dad was not just going to sit there and have that. He stands up to Stan and starts berating him in front of pretty much the entire school. He basically says Stan is a bully because of one of three reasons. One, he's an insecure little girl on the inside. Two, his brain is underdeveloped like that of a caveman. And three, he has a small wiener. For me, it's the latter. Now with the three reasons, which do you think got the crowd going the most? Of course, the last one. He ends his little speech by telling Stan, don't hurt yourself, big boy. And that does the job. He didn't even need to lift a finger. Well, except to spin the ball. Mike is now back home and Ned won't even let him drink because he's technically not 21 yet. He's now eating and telling Ned that he's a bad dad because he just found out his son spent the last year being the high school punching bag and his daughter's dating a jackass. Okay, let's just pause for a second there because what the hell is Mike eating? What the hell is this combo? The depressing meal? While he's eating this health hazard, he says he has figured out that his spirit path is not about basketball. It's about helping his kids. So he drops his food and drives straight to Alex's house. Technically his house. Alex is hooping and he's actually good. So Mike says he'll get him on the school team. And while they're talking, Naomi and Scarlett pull up. I was waiting for her to act like she doesn't recognize that face, but thankfully she disappoints me. She's stretching and pulling his face now and saying he looks just like her ex-husband. Meanwhile, Naomi thinks it's just a case of Scarlett still being fixated on Mike. So while Scarlett is saying this Mark guy looks exactly how her husband used to look in high school, Naomi is insisting that she just needs to get with someone new. And I'm really just wondering why they're having this conversation conversation in front of her son and his friend. Mike figures out how weird that is and confronts Naomi about it. Someone had to. The next day, he goes to health class and sees his daughter hanging out with Stan in front of the class. He breaks that up and the teacher says that the official school policy for such things is abstinence. Hmm, sure. Anyway, Mike echoes the abstinence part and says everyone should make a pact to abstain, but of course nobody is with him on that. He even appears to lose some cool points on that. The teacher even admits that it's a pretty unrealistic ask. She then proceeds to pass around some balloons to the class and right in front of him, his daughter's boyfriend grabs a handful. Man, that must be a nightmare for any father. Anyway, Mike plays it cool and talks about the importance of true love and how you should only be with someone that you truly love. And his little speech sort of hits Maggie and almost every girl in the class, to be honest. They all return the balloons, but trust Stan to take even more. He says, more for me. Now I got enough for the whole weekend. And then looks at Maggie again. This time, Mike loses it. He pounces on Stan, but Stan gets on top and goes in raw with a couple punches to the face. And you can trust everyone to bring out their phones, record, and circulate the video. Within minutes, the video had gone around the school. It even went viral on YouTube. But guess who this is good for? Yes, Ned. Because after that fight, the principal asked to see the parents of the boys, and Ned flies straight down in his Sunday best. His Sunday best is him looking like an idiot, by the way. But he says it's a technique called peacocking, as it serves as both an attention getter and an icebreaker. I for one call the outfit cock blocking. He gets into the principal's office and makes a fool of himself. But before he even grabs a seat, she has already figured him out completely. She says, are you peacocking? Really? You think that's gonna work? What universe is this movie set in? Anyways, he thinks it is. We'll see. Anyway, Mike is now at his ex-wife's house, and he walks up to her in the driveway, and she's still shocked at the resemblance. He helps her carry some stuff from the car to the backyard where she's still doing some work. She's now telling him the idea she has for the refurbishment of the yard, and he blurts out, it's gonna be amazing, Scar. Oh, he messed up again. Apparently, Mike is the only one who calls Scarlet Scar, so she gets a little suspicious, but he manages to wiggle out of it. She thinks he's just trying to hunt a cougar, but she says it's not gonna happen. He says that's not even what he meant. Anyway, what we see next is a montage of Mike having fun with his unsuspecting family. He's helping Scarlet with the yard, helping Alex with basketball, and helping Maggie get away from that Stan lad. And somewhere in between, we see Ned doing some grand gestures to get the principal's attention. She's not interested. Alex made the basketball team, and of course, his mom is very proud of him. Then she takes the boys outside to show them the yard. She just finished it, and it actually does look lovely. Mike is blown away. He tells her that when people see how amazing she is, she could be designing gardens all over the city. But just while he was still taking in the beauty of everything, she tells him she has to go because she has a date tonight. You can tell that hearing that devastated him, but he tries to play it cool. She says she's going dancing, and it's ridiculous because she's a terrible dancer and he messes up yet again, and says you're an amazing dancer. She goes what? But he manages to cover up yet again. She goes in, gets stressed, and is dancing in front of the mirror. When Mike comes in and tells her to teach him how to dance, he goes to the stereo, picks a CD, puts it in. The song he chooses just happens to be the song they dance to at their wedding. What were the odds, right? It's a really romantic song. And as you'd imagine, it requires a pretty romantic dance, which they're now doing. While they're dancing, Scarlet makes sure to always move Mike's hand up from her waist. This movie is weird. As that is going on, he asks Scarlet if she'll ever get back with her husband, and she says no. She loves her husband and cares about him, but sometimes that just isn't 
isn't enough. He's got to be rich too. Anyway, Mike now lifts her and is spinning her around and their faces are coming so dangerously close to each other. Alex shows up right in time to break that off. He turns off the music and tells his mom that her date is here. Scarlett goes to answer the door and Mike is just behind to try and ruin it, but his attempts are futile. Scarlett hands him the divorce papers to give to Ned, to give to Mike, and remind him he has to be there on the 27th. Then she grabs her coat and leaves. Just as his wife leaves, his daughter runs out to a car and says she's going to Jamie's party. So Mike drags Alex there immediately. They're at the party and Mike is trying to get Alex to talk to Nicole. Alex then asks Mike, what do you even know about girls? And he starts telling him about how he used to date the most beautiful girl in school. The letter slipped through his fingers. He's telling him about his mother, but of course he doesn't even know. He eventually forces Alex to go talk to Nicole and then goes in search of Maggie. He's asking Maggie's friends where she is, but all they're interested in is unwrapping him like a Christmas present. He nearly falls for one, but he shakes himself out of it because he remembers that deep down he's like 40. Come on, man. He sits them down and gives them a little lecture about respect, but they say they don't even want him to respect them. Whoa. That's where he gives up and leaves. Meanwhile, Alex is totally blowing it with Nicole, and not in the fun way, telling her she looks like his dog who is dead. This guy has zero game, or riz as the kids call it these days. But before we know it, he's on fire. And not on fire as in he's now saying the right things, but literally on fire. So he runs into the restroom. Just around that time, Mike finds Maggie, who doesn't seem exactly pleased to see him there. But Mike doesn't care. He goes straight to addressing the elephant in the room. He asks her why she's dating Stan, considering he's crazy and all. And she tells him not to say that about him. But she goes on to tell him worse things, including that she and Stan will be moving in together after graduation. And Mike says, there's no way in hell that's happening. He tells her he won't let her give up her future for some psychopath who doesn't even care about her. And he goes on to say he forbids her from ever seeing him again. She was bound to react after that. She says, who do you think you are? My father? In fact. But of course he doesn't tell her. Anyway, she walks away. Next, we see Scarlett and this new guy at the high school basketball court. They've come to watch Alex, and she's just remembering that the last time she was here, Mike asked her to marry him. Anyway, Mike is on the court. There's just a little less than a minute left to play. He looks around and sees Stan kissing his daughter, and another man sitting so close to his wife. Of course, it affects him, but it acts as fuel this time. He scores some vital points and assists Alex to score the winning three points. Alex is the hero now. Nicole runs up to him to hug and congratulate him, but he's still very awkward. Now we see the principal being asked out by Ned outside the school. She says no, so he says he'll buy every student a laptop. How rich is Ned really? Anyway, she agrees to go out with him even though she insists it's not a date. She just wants him to stop the harassment. He has a limo ready, but she said she doesn't want any of that so they just go in the car. Mike sees him getting into the principal's car just after promising Alex he'll get him another chance with Nicole, and he announces a victory party at his house. His house being Ned's house, of course. He goes to the amphitheater and sees Maggie crying there all alone. Stan dumped her because she didn't want to play with the balloons he got from class. <laughs> <laughs> he gives her some words of encouragement, and she tries to kiss him. So he just had to wiggle himself away from that. But God knows he was bricked up. <laughs> he invites her to the party tonight, and everyone else is getting invited too. Now we're at the party, and everybody's there. Alex is doing better with Nicole. Meanwhile, Ned and the principal are on their date. Ned is being an absolute weirdo with the wine, smelling it, and making some weird sounds with it in his mouth. She gives him a look, so he just confesses that he doesn't know how to act normal, and he's just doing all of this to impress her. He would not normally do any of this kind of stuff. He confesses that what he would rather do is spend 10 grand on Gandalf the Grey's quarter staff from the two towers. And who would have guessed it? She's also a fan. They connect on that and that's it. He's in. Back at the party, Stan is still disturbing Maggie for her sussy activities, but she manages to resist the pressure and tell him she's with someone else now. Just then, Mike shows up and asks him to leave the party. Before he leaves, Mike swings at him, but Stan holds his hand and punches him in the face. He blacks out. He wakes up saying he had the craziest dream. He was back in high school and all that. He's calling Scarlett's name, but to his absolute horror. It's his daughter right there. And it's kind of a nightmare that we're gonna skip over. He's running around trying to escape her, but she thinks he's just playing games. So she's just running around after him. He tries to stop her from doing anything with him, so she just assumes he's not about that life. That must have all been very frightening for Mike. Meanwhile, Ned's date is going great. They're even communicating in Gandalf's language. They're ready to head home now. That home, by the way, is still completely filled with the high schoolers she governs. And we see Scarlet come in to look for Alex. Mike stops her and tells her Alex is fine and might even have a girlfriend by the end of the night. Then he takes her upstairs. Jane and Ned now pull up at the house and are met with total chaos, but with just one whistle. Jane gets everyone to disperse. She's really good at her job, isn't she? Anyway, Mike is upstairs with Scarlett watching Alex have fun. And Scarlett is talking about how nice it is that Mike, I should say Mark in this instance, cares about Alex so much because the boy really needs a role model. Mike tells her she's a great mom. Just about the time that Maggie and her friends catch sight of them on the balcony. As they're still watching, he makes a move on Scarlett and gets a slap in return. She's walking briskly away from him while he's chasing her and telling her he's actually her husband and the father of her kids. She doesn't want to hear it. Just then, Maggie and her friends show up and slap him one after the other. Now it's a party. But it's not only a 
sad night for Mike. It's also a sad night for Ned. Jane says she can't do this as the students have already seen her with a student's parent. Mike comes and apologizes, but he gets four slaps and a hug from Ned. Next morning, Ned is cleaning up while Mike is sulking because he has lost his family. Ned tells him to move on, but he says he doesn't want to. Incidentally, this is the same day that court hearing for the divorce is supposed to happen. So they rush off to court in a sweet yellow Lamborghini convertible. Mike holds up a siren and that helps them arrive just in time to hold up the judge's ruling. Ned hands a forged law degree to the judge and she lets him talk. But one sentence is enough for her to know this is BS. So she tells the orderly to take them out. But Mike says he has a letter from Mike and Scarlett says she'd like to hear it, so they allow him. The letter is basically Mike reminding Scarlett of how they met, the homecoming dance, when she first told him she loved him, and how he lost his way as he grew up, and blamed her for everything. Mike is tearing up now. Scarlett is tearing up too, but the judge is not. She tells Mike to leave. He drops the paper there and walks out with Ned. Scarlett asks for postponement, and the judge postpones the case for 30 days. Then she goes to pick up the paper Mike dropped and it's just some irrelevant directions written on the paper. That tells her all she needs to know. Later at night, Mike is hooping at Ned's house. He's practicing to impress the college scouts. Ned says if he goes to college, he'd get off his spirit path, and Mike yells, there's no path. I can't do it. He says everyone is happier with him out of the picture, so he's just trying to move on now. At about the same time, Scarlett goes through her high school yearbook to remind herself of what Mike looked like back then. Then she goes out and sees a hammock with a note and a ring on it. The note is from Mike, and it says, I wish I could finish all the things I started. While she's still holding the note, Maggie he comes and says it's time to go. Then we see Mike on the basketball court hooping and practicing for the game. And coach comes in and gives the exact same speech he gave back in 1989. Then they go take a picture. Then the cheerleaders do their thing. You know exactly as it was in 1989. Scarlett and Maggie show up to watch the game and Mike and Scarlett lock eyes. Ned, meanwhile, has not given up on Jane. He shows up in this weird coat and tries to win her again. But she insists she cannot be seen with the parent of a student. He then replies, but Jane, how can you be seen with me when I'm wearing the cloak of invisibility? And believe it or not, she finds it hilarious. Ned now says all he's asking is to be friends, but we all know that's a lie. Anyway, she agrees. Or in her words, you can plunder my dungeon anytime. Whoa. Meanwhile, Mike on the court now makes a gesture at Scarlet, and she just goes, oh my god, I can't be here again. I have to go. And she just stands up and leaves. From there, everything from the 1989 game and the present are just intertwining in his head. What does he do? He hands the ball over to his son, tells him, it's your turn now, and runs after his wife. His spear guide is very happy about the decision he just made. As he's running towards his wife, he transforms back to his adult self. She tells him he didn't have to come after her again, but he says he had to because he loves her. He tells her she's the best decision he ever made. He just forgot. He says he wants to make it up to her if she can just give him a second chance. And damn right she can. They make up and they walk out while Alex is killing it on the court. Now Mike is at Ned's house. He's packed and ready to leave, so he goes to give Ned his key back. And Viola. It's Ned and the principal hanging out. Oh, with elf ears I see. I shall refrain from judgment. As it appears, Mike is taking over from Murphy as coach of the high school basketball team. Great job. Moral of the story? Just walk up to her and say hi.